Let's stand together. I trust that you found your place in God's Word, Matthew chapter 17. And we will begin reading in just a moment in verse number one. I do thank God for the privilege to preach His Word and never get tired of that, never get over the awesome responsibility it is to rightly divide His Word. And as human beings, we don't have to wonder what God thinks about certain things. He's told us in His Word. Our job is that oftentimes we lack to get in it and get full understanding of what He's already told us. And I want you to pray for me. Of course, um, dealing with a little bit of a head cold. In my head, I sound pretty good, but out there I'm sure I sound pretty bad. I know I don't look good. That's been a curse of my whole life, but uh, just bear with me today. Pray for me, and uh, I'll give you what God's given me to give you today. Thank you. Uh, thank our pastor for the opportunity to preach, and always kind of an honor uh, to preach in his pulpit when he's away. Matthew 17, let's begin reading in God's Word in verse number one. The Bible says, and after six days... Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Help me as I preach it today. And these folks, as they listen, may we each leave here changed more like Christ is our prayer. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I'm just curious, how many of you uh, today are hikers or Climbers, you like to climb stuff. Raise your hand big and high. Uh, some of you, how many of you say, I'm too old, I can't climb anything, not even steps anymore. Anybody like, like that? I love watching kids climb things. I take my kids to some of the parks around Long Beach and, and anything you can get on. Uh, they, yeah, look at me. Oh, get down. <laughs> I've got insurance, but it's not that good, you know. Don't, don't hurt yourself. And uh, I even love it. I think my wife loves it more than I do is occasionally she'll coax me into climbing up there with them. And we went to one park, I can't recall off the top of my head where it was, they had this big fake rock sculpture type of thing. And all my, you know, my boys were like, oh, let's get up there, Dad, let's get up there, Dad, Dad, Dad. And then my wife, you know, she pulls that, come on, babe, you can get up there. <laughs> so I know I can, why would I want to? I'm a grown man, you know, I'm in my 30s, and some total stranger is going to walk by and go, look at that weirdo. But finally I did. I got up there and I felt like I was king of the mountain. You know, I got up there, yeah, look at dad. And then she's like, well, okay, uh, let's get our boys up there. All right, hand me dad. All right, get up there. I'll sit down. All right, where's Dawson? Get him up there. And then Davison, we're up there. And man, we're all excited. Man, we're up really high, dad. Oh, no, we're up really high. This is awesome. And my wife's taking pictures on her iPad. And this is just a wonderful, exciting time. And then the excitement sort of went away. And I'm sitting up there going, how do we get down? Because <laughs> I'm not kidding you, the sides of this thing were almost completely vertical. And I, I said, man, I'm going to have to jump off of this. And I'm not as young as I used to. I mean, even when I was young, I wasn't good at jumping down off of things. <laughs> I would always get hurt. And I know something bad's going to happen. And of course, I handed the boys down to my wife. And like any good wife, she, she left. Because she thought, well, dad can get down on his own. And I, I preferred that she leave because I would very much not like to have her around if I was going to hurt myself and embarrass myself. I'd prefer to not have an audience. So say, what's the moral of that? The moral is don't climb things unless you figure out first you can get down easily. All right. That's what I had to figure out. But I grew up in Northeast Tennessee, Southwest Virginia area around the mountains in that area. So I'm a mountain boy. I like uh, mountain people somewhat. They're a little off, but you know, everybody's got their ticks sometimes. 
And, uh, but I enjoy being around the mountains. I love watching the trees change. In fact, my wife is from Lebanon, Missouri, and I remember going up to visit her family for the first time, and we were driving on this highway, and she said, look over there. Doesn't that look like one of the mountains in Tennessee? I said, no, it looks like a hill to me. <laughs> I, I like mountains. I did a lot of hiking when I was younger. I was in the Boy Scouts. Well, you can tell that by looking at me that I was in the Boy Scouts. I was not an Eagle Scout. In fact, I didn't have a troop nearby until I was 17 years old. So I got in, in a troop that our, our, my home church started, and I began to work on my patches. Those Any, any of you Scouts in here? Any of you working on that? Awesome. Um, the lowest badge you can earn is Tenderfoot. So as the, at the strapping age of 18, I earned it my Tenderfoot badge. And I began to strut around and go, guess what I am? I'm a tenderfoot, you know? That doesn't sound very masculine. It didn't impress anybody. So after about a year, I, I could not be a scout anymore. They had some other things you could join into. But uh, long story short, I became an assistant scout master. I learned, hey, I can boss little boys and tell them what to do. When I didn't even earn the badges, I can make them do the stuff to earn them too. But I took my leadership training in that and spent a few freezing cold weekends out in a tent with a bunch of other smelly men. Exciting stuff like that. All to be an assistant scout master. But there was a lot of helpful things that I learned by being in the Boy Scouts. There was uh, things that I learned about how to put a tent down and how to create a moisture barrier and put a tarp down and all of those kinds of things. And I enjoyed camping out and all those type of things. I really enjoyed the food and learning what a Dutch oven was and how you could make a meal and dessert in the same pot. Are you kidding me? That's awesome. And I wish my wife would do that. It'd be a lot easier to eat and to clean up at times. But one of the helpful things they taught us was when you were climbing a really steep hill or the side of a mountain. And one of the things that they taught me, I don't know if it was in the scouting manual or anything, but that you can really help yourself out by using things to help you climb. If there's trees nearby, obviously you can use a tree for support and pull yourself up, but they taught, taught us really to rest often, that you get up and then lean on the tree, conserve your energy. Another big thing that they taught me, which at the time I didn't realize, but I do now, is they said, make sure you use each step to the fullest possible amount. They said that the average person that climbs doesn't really extend their legs all the way. So that when you, when you climb, they said you need to extend your leg as far as it'll go, then take your next step. And if you do that, it actually makes the climb shorter. And it takes less energy to do that. Say, so, now why are you talking all about climbing, Brother Doug? What is the point of this instead of you just rambling on about some stories of you being a Boy Scout? Who cares about you? Well, honestly, yeah, who cares about me? But in the text that we read about this morning, we read about the Lord Jesus Christ, and I very much care what He did in His earthly ministry. And on this particular day, the Bible says that He gathers three other men with Him, and they go climbing. They climb a mountain. Now, historically and theologically, the Scripture doesn't really tell us specifically which mountain that they climbed on this particular day. We do not know. Now, you might say, well, I know because I know the Bible. Great, but the Bible doesn't say, so we can argue about that until the Lord comes back. No one knows for sure. Now, i got a picture to show you. Many people believe that it was Mount Tabor in Galilee. Just the location, the time of his ministry there. There are many who believe that it could have been Mount Tabor, but I'm not telling you for sure that that is the place. But I just want to show you that picture, give you a mental image here. The Lord Jesus Christ, on an average morning, got up and called Peter, James, and John, and said, I want you to follow me. And what they did on that day changed their lives forever. And I want to share with you this morning four works that Christ performs as we follow Him. If we look at this text of these men who climb this mountain, we're going to learn four works that the Lord does in my life and in your life when we choose to follow Him. I want you to see the first work that Christ does. That's that Christ separates us. Christ separates us. Notice again verse number 1, if you would please. The Bible says, "...and after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain, notice this word, 
apart. There was a morning when Jesus Christ gathered these three men. This was the inner circle. These were the inner three. These men are normally linked in Scripture for importance and really as a foundational base for the establishment and the building of His church on earth. These were going to be some key men that He was going to use in a very special and unusual way in their, their ministries for the Lord. But here, I want you to understand that this was not a very special day to these guys. I've heard this statement and I've, I'm really learning that this is true, that men are remembered for extraordinary days, but they're made on ordinary ones. We normally remember men for extraordinary days, extraordinary moments, times in history that were very important and, and very maybe heightened on world matters and world situations and of great importance. But I want to tell you that men are not made on extraordinary days. They're really made on ordinary ones. There's been times in my life that I look back on with great fondness and really I, I think in my mind these were very extraordinary, extraordinary times in my own personal walk with God. But can I tell you, they did not begin as some fantastic, extraordinary day. They began as Mondays, as Saturdays, as teen camps, as a conferences. Can I tell you, they, they began as a normal Sunday morning service. <coughs> Excuse me, they began with boogers in my eyes. And my teeth needed to be brushed. They happen like normal, ordinary days would happen, but I want to tell you, what makes them extraordinary to a child of God is not you on those days. It's the fact that God shows up and leads you in a new direction. And can I tell you, to these men, this was an ordinary day. This is six days after the Lord had just been into His earthly ministry in a certain area, and now six days later, He says, hey, Peter, James, and John, come on in. Can you imagine this? Personal time with Jesus. I mean, how would you feel if your boss of the corporation you work for, or the company you work for, hey, I want you and two other guys to come with me on a private retreat? Some of you would be like, oh, man. <laughs> Some of you might say, awesome. Where are we going? Oh, it's an all-expense paid trip. Don't worry about it. Yes! I can't wait to go home and tell my wife. And then you find out, he said, yeah, we're going to climb a mountain. Yay? <laughs> Great. <laughs> and can you imagine, here these men are with Jesus Christ. They, Jesus Christ says, hey, you guys, come on. Where are we going, Jesus? Are we going to do some miracle? Remember this, this is God in the flesh. They'd seen Him do miracles. What? What is going to happen today that we're going to get to go back and tell all the other disciples about? What wondrous miracle are we going to be a part of exclusively between us and Jesus? That I mean, this is just going to be the biggest thing that's happened in our life. And you know what Jesus Christ says? Come on, we're going to go climb a mountain. Really? Is there something awesome at the top of that mountain? Just follow me. No, we're going to go climbing. Now, their reaction, I don't know, but their reaction might be similar to my reaction. I don't really want to do that. That's not my idea of a good time. <laughs> I would not enjoy working on a time when I'm supposed to be with you privately one-on-one. -on -one. Can I tell you two things specifically about this work that Christ separates us? Here's the first thing, is that many times... Jesus Christ will take us through times of isolation. And I tell you, there are many areas of your Christian life and mine that should be and ought to be done corporately. By that I mean together with other believers. The Bible talks often about gathering together. We're to worship God corporately. Together, we're to gather together in a place. Quite literally, the word church, ecclesia, a called out assembly, people to assemble together. That's what a church is. This church is not the property. It's not the facilities. If an earthquake or some terrible accident happened tomorrow and all of our facilities were gone, wiped clean from the earth, the First Baptist Church would still be alive and well. It's not this property. It's the people who are here. It's the assembly together. But can I tell you that if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a large part of your Christian life that will be done in isolation. It will be one-on-one -on -one with God. You see, as much as I love my wife, there are certain parts of my Christian life 
my wife cannot travel with me. As much as I love our pastor, there are certain things I can't do with my pastor and fulfill my own personal walk with God. You have children, you have a great desire to see those children serving the Lord and raised to know the Lord in a personal and real way. But I want to tell you, there comes a time when your children will have to face and follow God themselves. You can't take them on that journey. And these men are faced with a very extraordinary opportunity. Jesus Christ says, I want you, you, and you to come with me alone. They have to make a choice. Do I stay with all the others and enjoy that fellowship and enjoy that time, or do I launch out and go with Jesus Christ where He is leading? And I want to tell you that there's a lot of people who are going to miss out on some things in their Christian life because they're not willing to go with God alone. If you're waiting for everybody on your block to pat you on the back before you're going to step out and do things for God, you're never going to do it. If you're waiting to have a spouse who always encourages you to do the right thing and to follow God for yourself, there are some things you will not do. If you're waiting for your pastor to nudge you along or to drag you or to pull you into certain things in following God, you will never experience those times with him because all God says is he comes to you and says, follow me. And many, many times you'll be isolated. There'll be personal experiences, things God is doing with your life personally, not with the entire crowd, not with the multitude, not with your church, not with your family, but with you. There'll be times when we have to decide to follow Jesus Christ alone. And there'll be times where we can't follow Him with a crowd. Not only are there times of isolations, I want you to understand that there's also times of elevation. Notice that in Scripture He said, and high mountain." He took them to a high mountain. In mountain climbing and hiking and things, there's normally a general rule that the higher you go, the thinner the air gets. And so you may even do more breathing, but in fact, many times you take in less oxygen. That's why they tell people who are climbing mountains and things, you need to, you need to control your breathing. You need to, you need to regulate that. You can, You'll easily exert yourself. Your, your body will go into shock to some degree if you don't get enough oxygen into your body. The higher you go, the thinner the air gets. And I think that's a good way to illustrate this truth. I want you to understand this morning that the higher a Christian goes with the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we will need to let go of lesser things. The more we'll need to let go of lesser things. If I told you that you were going somewhere for a month and all that you were given was a backpack, an average size backpack, let me ask you a very important question. How selective would you be about the items you chose to put in that backpack? One month of time, only one backpack. What would you pack? What would you leave? What would you take? What would be important? What would be needed? What would be something you could live without? And can I tell you that as we follow Jesus Christ, there are going to be times in your life when you are going to follow Him alone. Your husband, your wife, they're, they're not going with you. You are walking with God for yourself. Jesus Christ is taking you personally where He wants to lead you and where He wants you to go. And there's going to be times when He wants to take you to another level. And when He takes you to another level, a step up in your Christian life, I'm going to tell you, you are going to have to let go of some lesser things. There's not as much room at the top as there is where you are now. It amazes me the people who think, I want to get closer to God and nothing in their life changes. Nothing changes. Their routines never change. Their priorities never change. Their emphasis in their life never changes. Yet they desire to have a walk with God closer than what they have now. This is not rocket science, but let me drop some, as they say, drop some knowledge on you. If anything is going to change, something must change. I just blew somebody's mind. They're like, whoa, say it again. <laughs> If something is going to change, something must change. If you want a closer walk with God, you have to change something. If Jesus Christ takes you to another level, 
you're going to have to let go of some things that you used to hold on to pretty tight. There's not as much room at the top. Let me ask you this. Are you willing to go with Christ to a higher level in your life? Man, I want that so badly for my life. I don't want to stay the same. Life makes you change. Have you noticed that? You don't have any choice about it. Now the world loves to convince you you can. You can stay the same. Buy this ointment that takes all your wrinkles away. No, it doesn't. You're putting a chemical on your face to tell your body to stop doing what it's naturally supposed to do. Don't do that. Don't do that. See, I look like I'm 35 again. But you're not. You're not. I mean, what if they had a fruit that was bad, but they could paint it in such a way to make it look fresh? Would you still eat it? Would you want that kind of fruit? No. I don't want to be... Listen, I've worked hard to get the way I am. <laughs> I, want to, I want to enjoy it. <laughs> Uh, you know, when my hair comes out, I want to run around and go, look at this hair that fell out. You did this to me. Look, hey, kids, come here. Look at this. This is you in action right here. You see this? You. <laughs> oh, hide that, hide that, hide that. Got to go to the beautician. See what they can do with me. They can't do much. All right? They've only got so much to, to work with. My mom's a beautician. She's done hair all, all her life that I've known her. And she had this sign at her desk that said, I'm a beautician, not a magician. Okay? <laughs> Alakazam, you're still going to be the way you are, maybe just tinted and with less money in your pocket when you leave. But there are going to be things Christ desires for you to change in your life that you can go higher and closer with Him. Let me ask you this morning, are you willing to leave behind the lesser things? Hear me, the common things. Some of the things that are important to everybody, are you willing to lay some of those aside for a greater purpose? To go a little bit higher and closer with Christ? Can I tell you that Jesus Christ did not redeem you and I to live a mundane, routine, ordinary life. In fact, He said, I came that they might have life and that they would have it more abundant. But hear me, you can't have an abundant life being filled with everything everybody else has. You can't. First word that Jesus Christ does, He separates us. Here's the second thing He shares with us. Look at verse number 2 again. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, He was transfigured before them. And His face did shine as the sun. And His raiment was white as the light. Can you imagine this? Here's these men. They've been with Jesus in His entire earthly ministry. And at the top of this mountain, they get to the top. I mean, remember, this is an ordinary day to them. They, they just climbed a mountain with Jesus Christ, but big deal. They've gone a lot of places with Jesus. They've got in boats and followed Him. They've walked journeys and followed They went through fields and followed over hills, over everywhere. They, they're finally now at the top of a mountain. And out of nowhere, seemingly, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is transfigured before them. That word transfigured, meaning Literally, into another form. That now they were with Him as Jesus Christ the man, but now they're with Him in, as Jesus Christ in His glory. And can you imagine that? These men say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, I was just with Him, and He didn't look like that. He wasn't that way. His face didn't shine. His clothes weren't radiating light. I think if we went back in time to Bible times, they would say this was a UFO sighting. Light everywhere. What is going on up there? And the Lord Jesus Christ, can I tell you, what does He share with us? Same thing He shared with these men. First of all, He shares who He is. Can I tell you, Jesus Christ did not become something He wasn't at the top of that mountain. He was already God. He was already glorious. He was already magnificent. Jesus Christ did not become something that he was not already. What he did is just like a garment he laid aside a little bit. He peeked and opened up that glory so that these men would see something about him they'd never seen before. Do you understand that? That the biggest priority God has for you in your Christian life is that you know him. And to know him means you have to learn things about him you didn't already know. And to learn things, can we not all agree? 
You're going to have to be taken through situations where you're taught. And these men up on that mountain, do you know what they had to learn? They needed to learn who Jesus Christ was. Well, they knew who He was. If you look back in chapter number 16, I mean, Peter said, Jesus Christ says, who do men say that I am? And what does Peter do? He answers right. Right answer. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And even Jesus Christ said, hey, you said right. And you didn't just figure that out on your own. The Holy Spirit of God has given you that truth. He's confirmed that in your life. But can I tell you, there's a great difference between knowing who Jesus Christ is here and knowing who He is in your faith life. I dare to say that the majority of people in this building know who Jesus Christ is. Factually. You can give me a pretty good definition of who He is. Where He lived geographically, some of the stuff that He did in His life. But if we began to go around the room and I began to ask people, do you really know God? Some people would start stammering and stuttering and... Uh, 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 uh. Well, yeah, I knew, I knew Him here. When I was a kid, my parents told me this about Him. I'll tell you, God wants to move from more than just an acquaintance of yours to being someone who you know intimately. You know, we treat God like, hey, hey man, good to see you. You know, you pull that with people at church, don't you? You forgot their name. So you walk up, hey, bro, hey brother, brother, great to see you, brother. And you, and you leave and somebody goes, what's his name? I have no idea. Hey, brother, good to see you, brother. Good to see you, brother. Oh, sister, you look great today. Who is that? What is her name? Sister so-and-so? I don't, I don't know. We pull that with people, don't you? Hey, good to see Hey, you, buddy. Hey, buddy. Good to see you, buddy. Buddy, boy, son, man. Hey, man. We do that all the time. You know what I mean? We want people to feel like, oh, you're important to me. I'm going to tell you what, we got a relationship going right there. What is their name? You know, it's sad to say, but there's a lot of Christians who are that way with God. Oh, you might know His name. But you read His Word and you go, really? He does stuff like that? People are talking about Him. You go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can't really relate to what they're talking about. You don't really know Him that way. They start talking about how God answered their prayer. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I prayed for my food that one time and I didn't die. I, I, get, I understand God answers prayer. But we don't, do we? See, there's a lot of you, for instance, who know my wife. But you don't know her like I know her. I can look at my wife and know what kind of mood she's in. I know when to duck. And I know when to say, hey. I know her. You only think you know her. If you really knew her. No, I'm just... <laughs> if I really knew some of you, we would be already out by now. I'd say, there's no sense in, in wasting my breath on all this crowd. I'll tell you what. Aren't you glad there's some people you don't know as well as you'd like to know? <laughs> but can I tell you, God wants to know you intimately. And when you go up higher with Him, you're going to learn who He truly is. But here's another thing you're going to learn. You're going to learn what He is doing. The Bible says that when they're up on this mount, two men appear and talk to the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses and Elias. That would be Elijah. Moses, a great picture of the law. Elijah, the great prophet, a picture of prophecy, the prophets. Do you understand the meaning there? That's a great picture of the Word of God. And they're talking with Jesus Christ. In fact, in Luke, the book of Luke, a parallel passage to this, it tells specifically that they're talking about when Jesus Christ is going to be deceased in Jerusalem. They're talking about His death. You say, well, well what does this mean that they, they, they're told the plan of these people? Well, if you look back in the previous chapter of the book of Matthew, in chapter number uh, uh, 16, you're going to realize that right after Peter says, hey, you're Christ, the Son of the living God, you know what Jesus Christ goes on to say? Let's look at it really, really quickly. Um, if you look back here in verse number 21, it says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto His disciples how that He might go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Okay, He starts beginning to tell them specifically why He came. You know, when the Messiah came, they expected kingdoms to fall. 
armies to rush in and take down Roman rule over the entire world and God would usher in his kingdom on earth but Jesus Christ is trying to say, you guys have missed it a mile away. That is coming but that's not now. That's not God's plan for right now. That's not God's plan for you. That's not God's plan for me. He began to tell them specifically what his plan is. Now get this, who's up on the mountain with him? Peter, James, and John. Read the very next verse, the response to that. Then Peter took him. What does that mean? <laughs> it means he grabbed him. He took him off the side. And what did he say? Listen. And began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And then goes on, Jesus Christ gives that great statement, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now get this, here's a guy who had very great intentions, but he was ignorant of God's plan and how it was going to happen. And now they're up on this mountain and they not only see Jesus Christ for who He is, He is God. He is the very Son of God. But now they see Moses and Elijah and they begin to understand, wait a second, wait a second, this is more than just a man from Nazareth planning to go to Jerusalem and planning to die on his own. Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. I'm beginning to see something here. Here's the law. Here's the prophets. They're talking with him. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of both of those things. And can you understand what it is nailing home to these men? That all that is taking place is according to God's divine plan. This was not accidental. This was not something just happening. This is the way God intended for it to be. And can I tell you that it's just in the times that we go higher with God, we begin to understand what God is really doing in this world. You ever wondered why some people launch out by faith and do some pretty unusual and amazing things, but a lot of people don't? In fact, when you hear of people doing those things, you sort of scratch your head and go, why would... Why would somebody do that? Why would they give up their job to go start a church? Why would... What? Could it be... Could it just be the reason some people are willing to go that far is because they've gone up a little higher with Christ than you have? Could it be that before we make fun or in bewilderment go, what is going on? That's dumb. Why would they do something like that? Could it not be that we could stop for just a minute and consider, could it not be Jesus Christ has taken them a little farther with Him than you've been yet, and they've got a glimpse of His bigger plan? You know, the good thing about a mountain, the, the higher up you go, your perspective changes, doesn't it? Things that seem so huge when you're at the bottom, when you're on top, seem so minor. So small, so, can I pull it into application? So petty. And do you see why some people who have walked with God, not in a bragging way, but they've gone a little higher with God, and you see why they get so frustrated with some people who all they see are these big things. I cannot get over this. i got to leave this church because of this. And they say, that's nothing. That's so small. That's so... Easy. That's not even something to worry about. From, from where I'm at, that's not even on the radar. Why don't you see what God is really doing, but they can't? Because they haven't climbed with Him. He shares with us very quickly the last two things. But He stills us. If you read this account, you notice that while all this is going on, did you notice what the Bible says there? Verse number 4, then, P then answered Peter. Now, I love Peter because I, I'm just like him sometimes. But I heard a preacher preach out of this passage. I thought it was great. But he said, why did Peter answer? Nobody asked him anything. Jesus Christ is talking with Moses and Elijah. And then the Bible says, and answer, then answer Peter. You know what he did? He got so wrapped up in what was going on, now he had it. <laughs> what, did, what did he say? Lord, it is good for us to be here. Woo! This is awesome. I can't, but somebody pinch me. 
James, John, Pippin, this is awesome. And then he goes on to make his own plans. Lord, if you will. Don't you love when Christians say that? Well, I just want the Lord's will to be done. But then they make a mile-long list of what plans they want God to bless, you know. So what do they do? They say, he says, Lord, if it's your will, let's build three tabernacles. One for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. We'll just camp out up here. This will be the most amazing place on planet Earth. I mean, we'll charge admission. People will come up here. This will be the most awesome experience. You can do your glowy thing. These guys can pop in and talk to you for a little while. And everybody can have this awesome experience with you and see who you really are and see part of your plan. This is going to be amazing. You know what Peter's problem is, or was? It's the same problem ours is. We get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> We're in the middle of what's going on and then we start making plans. God's trying to show us what His plan is. We're like, oh man, but let me tell you what I got in mind, God, because it's really good for us to be here. Can I tell you that Jesus knew that they weren't going to stay on the mountain? Let, answer me out loud, church. What was this place before they climbed it? It was a mountain. Let me help you out. Some of you are like, I have no idea. Uh, bunny rabbit. I mean, who? I don't know. It's a mountain. So let me ask you again. What was the place before they climbed it? What was it while they were there? What was it going to be when they left? So would you not agree with me that it's no place special because of what it is? It's only special because who was there? And what He was doing with it. And can I tell you, sometimes we get that way, don't we? We hold on to some things in our past. We make the things really special when it's not about the things, it's about who used them. No disrespect, but there's times when we give a lot of credit to people that really don't deserve it. It's the fact that God chose to use them. All men will fail you. You live long enough. I'm not being pessimistic, but everybody will let you down sometime. Everybody. And yet you hear people say, I'm not going back to that church anymore. There's a bunch of hypocrites. Well, it's amazing it took you that long to see them. They're everywhere. You might be one of them. I'll ask your spouse. They know. They'll be glad to tell everybody. <laughs> no. We don't hold on to things. There's people I've seen that I, I've been to this church for 59 years. I mean, when I die, they're going to bury me in this property and I'll never leave this property. Why? Why? Oh, if they ever change, they ever get rid of that pulpit, I'm leaving. Why? God never changes. God will never leave you. Things change. People change. Relationships change. The only thing that stays steady and constant in our lives is Jesus Christ and our relationship with Him. It doesn't matter if you're a little child in one of the children's classes at the age of five, six, seven years old. It doesn't matter if you're in your 90s pushing 100 and you're not able to physically come to this location anymore. You can still be as close to God, if not closer, than the day you got saved. It's not based on stuff and things. It's not a geographic location that makes you spiritual. It's your walk with your God. And when we get all busy and wrapped up in stuff and we start making our own plans and even with great intentions, we start messing and putting our hands in God's things. Do you understand that? We start putting our hands in God's stuff and in His plans. And God gave me children, but I want to chart it this way. And I want to include this in their life. And I want to do that. I want to tell you, God has a plan for them. God has a plan for you. And we don't need to mess with all the details sometimes. God knows what He's doing. He will work it out according to His will. You can't stop His will from happening. You may delay it, but you'll never annihilate it. God's will will always be done, even if He has to use lost, wicked, pagan, heathen people to accomplish it, He will. But I want to tell you, the goal is that we know Him, and when we get all entangled sometimes, you notice what happens? A cloud shows up. And it shuts Peter up. If you keep reading, you'll notice he, he kept talking. He wasn't finished. He had a lot going on. <laughs> And Lord, let me tell you one other thing. And, and this cloud overshadows them. And the voice comes out of the cloud. And it stills Peter. Can I tell you, I thank God for the times 
when God has interrupted me. I'm so thankful that there's been times when God has stopped me from really what I wanted to do. The way I preferred it. What I was so bent on pursuing. God has shown up in my life and He has stilled me. Whoa, 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 whoa. Peter, hey, hey, hey. Shh. <laughs> Ever shift your children before? Shh. Isn't that an annoying sound? People make so much more noise doing that than they do. Shh, be quiet. What'd you say? It's as if God shows up and goes, hey, Peter, Peter. No, 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 no. And he gives them the instruction we all need to hear. Listen to him. And can I interpret it into SoCal language for you? Zip your lip and hear what he has to say. It's not time for you to interject. It's time for you to get a hold of what's going on. He stills us, but can I tell you that He also steadies us. He hears this voice, and the men do what any sinful man would do in the presence of a holy God. They bow to the ground in humility. There's been people write songs, what are we going to do in the presence of God? You know, I can only imagine what I'm going to do. I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to do what in countless times in Scripture it says sinful men have done before the presence of a holy God. You're going to bow down. You're going to get on your face. You're going to see, because when you see who He is, you see yourself for who you really are. And you think, why in the world would a God as pure and holy, as righteous as you be anywhere near somebody like me? But this is what I love. You know what He does? The Bible says Jesus Christ walks over and He touches them. I'll tell you, the same God that can feel like you're worthless because you see His holiness and you see your own sinfulness, the same God that convicts you is the same God that will come over and say, hey, arise, be not afraid. The same God that you think, why would He love somebody like me is the same God who comes and touches your life and equips you to serve Him. Because His goal isn't for you to feel miserable or worthless or not valuable. His goal is that in spite of yourself, He can still use you and He wants to. He steadies our life. What if I fail? Oh, of course you're going to fail. Peter failed. Up there on the mountain in the midst of this religious experience, this wonderful time together, he failed. He ran his mouth instead of listening. But what happened? He said, arise, be not afraid. He touched him. And I love this expression in Scripture. When they looked up, what does the Bible say? They saw no man but Jesus only. I've heard a lot of preaching on that. I mean, preaching that would shake a chandelier to the ground. People would run around the building 12, 30 times. Say, what's the point of that? The point is that when you truly follow Him, you're going to come to a place in your life when it's not going to matter what the crowds think anymore. It's not really going to matter what your best friends say or what they think. You're not going to post a public opinion poll on your Facebook page to see which direction you're going to go. You're, you're not going to ask a lot of other people. You know what you're going to do? You're just going to look up and you're just really going to see Him. And that's all that's going to matter. The whole world's going to melt away. You're not really going to care about the things going on at the bottom of the mountain anymore or what's going on beside of it. You're going to forget all about your tabernacles you wanted to build. And you're just going to see Him. You say, well, Brother Doug, you've rambled on for a while. What's the point of all this? What's the point of climbing with Christ? What's the point of all these works that He wants to do? What's the point that He separates us? What's the point of that? What's the point that He, at times, He'll share things with us about Himself that we didn't know? What's the point that He stills us? What's the point that He steadies our life? Well, if you keep reading, let's read one verse together and I'm done this morning. Look at verse number 9. Chapter 17, verse 9 again. And as they came down from the mountain. See, Peter wanted to stay on the mountain. But Jesus Christ said, you don't get it, Peter. We came up here not to stay here. We came up here for a change to take place in your life. But now we're going back down. 
And you're going to tell other people what happened up here, and they, they might not understand. In fact, that's why he told them, don't tell anything that you saw till after I raised from the dead. So why did Jesus Christ do that? Well, can I tell you? He did that so these men would have a different view of Him in their personal life. And when they come down to the bottom of the mountain, you know what they find? They find a demon-possessed young man. They find ministry that needs to go on. And can I tell you, will you not answer this question for me? Do you not think that their perspective of everything they faced after that was a little bit different because they went up on the mountain? Oh, they didn't just view miracles as an annoyance anymore. I wish these people were just quit bothering us, Jesus. We're trying to take a break around here. I wish these people would just get a life. Send them away, Jesus. I mean, we're having ministry right here. Let's send these people away. Do you not think their perspective changed? Do you not think they, they got it just a little bit closer that now when there's issues going on, there's a problem, there's people hurting. There's people dealing with spiritual needs. There's people's lives who are being shattered and ripped apart by the effects of sin. Do you not think these men had just a little bit different perspective on the world around them? And because of that, it caused them to live differently. I'll boil it down to this. Why does God take you to the mountain? Why does God separate you and do things alone in your life? and cause you to see some things about Him you've never seen before. Very simply, it's because God's greatest desire is for you to know Him and for you to make Him known to others. You can't tell somebody about God if you don't know Him. Listen, I appreciate you. You're a first-time visitor. It's the first time you've been in this property ever. Thank you for coming and being with us. We count it an honor that you're here, but hear me. Being on this property doesn't get you any closer to God. It doesn't benefit your life at all. Because it's not about a property. It's about a person. And if you don't know Him, He can't help you. What do they say that old adage? It's not what you know, it's who you know. We've all gotten in on those deals sometimes, haven't we? Hey, 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 I know a guy. Let me get you his name and number. And thank God for those kind of contacts sometimes. Discounts and favors and wonderful things back and forth. Can I tell you, somebody else can tell you all they want about God, but until you know Him, what good is it to you? Your life's no different. But Christian Finn, let me tell you, just because you're one of His children doesn't mean you're where you need to be. There are times when children get away from their father. There's times we get away from God. And we're okay with it. Can I challenge you today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today would be a great opportunity for you to meet Him and come to know Him personally. If you're away from God today, could it be that today, it could be your last opportunity God's given you to get some things right with Him. And maybe you say, well, Brother Doug, I'm faithfully serving God. I want to follow God. Can I encourage you? There's times you feel alone, but can I tell you, Sometimes that's according to His plan. Because you can't do everything with everybody. There's times when you'll get a little higher and you're going to have to let go of some things that were really important to you at one time, but now they can't be as important. Because the Lord wants to show you something about Himself you've never seen before. And when you get a hold of who He is, yeah, you might start going off and making plans, but He's going to still you. Just when you think you can't, if you let Him, He'll touch your life and He'll use you to make Him known to somebody else.